Welcome to I'm Spiritual But, starring the award-winning author and actress Anne Scotland and globally renowned speaker and award-winning author Dr. Roger Leslie. I'm Spiritual But is a -a one-of-a-kind talk show about inclusive spirituality for religious and non-religious people alike. It's our vision to inspire everyone to discover their own unique spiritual experience. Email us at hello at imspiritualbutt.com. We'd love to hear from you or if you have a guest to recommend for the show. Thank you to USA Global TV, to our sponsors, and to all of you for spreading the word. And now, Anne Scotland and Dr. Roger Leslie. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to I'm Spiritual But. Good morning, Roger. Good morning, Anne. How are you today? I am so blessed today and grateful, and we have an extra special show today um, with an extra special guest, and I know everyone who's tuned in is going to really have a beautiful takeaway and experience today. So uh, before we get started, uh, for all of you, please do uh, like the show, subscribe on USA Global. Uh, check out our website at www.imspiritualbutt.com for more information or to reach out to us. And um, this show, if you this is your first time tuning in, this show is a, a conversation, a new global conversation about inclusive spirituality. And what that means is whether you're religious or not religious, we want you to have a place where you can work on finding your own highest and best spiritual experience. So we have guests, incredible guests, who share their own life story, share the work they're doing now, and give us ideas and suggestions for how we can live our best spiritual life. So uh, we hope you're welcome. You're included. This is a live show. So you can leave us questions, comments, questions and comments for our guests today, which you'll probably want to leave some uh, here on the platform. So please do that. And we'll look forward to responding to you as much as possible during the show. So, uh, Roger, I'm going to turn it over to you, and we're going to get this going right away. I'm honored to introduce our guest um, because we wanted to have him on the show for so long, and actually we had him scheduled previously and had to rearrange things, so we're happy that he's here. He's so kind. He's actually in an airport right now waiting for a flight that's been delayed three times. He was supposed to have already landed where he is, so this will be a great experience because he'll be live at the airport. But our guest today is Stan Mitchell. He is the founding pastor of Grace Point Church in Nashville, Tennessee, and teaching pastor at The Village in Atlanta, Georgia. He is, an, he is a passionate advocate for his LGBTQIA brothers and sisters and a thought leader in the evolution of progressive Christian theology. Would you all please welcome our wonderful guest, Stan Mitchell. Hi, gang. Hey, Stan. Welcome, oh. Stan. So happy to have you here. So glad to be here, even if it's from uh, the uh, wonderful confines of an airport lobby. (laughs) That is great. That means you're doing good things in the world. So we're happy and we just hope you get your flight. (laughs) (laughs) Same here. So Stan, we start our conversation usually by asking our guest to provide a quotation for us that will springboard our first conversation. So yours comes from transcendentalist Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Emerson said, the mind once stretched by a new idea, never returns to its original dimensions. What about that quotation touched you and has impacted your spiritual journey? Roger, I grew up in a highly fundamentalist setting, um, southeastern United States, little town in northeast Arkansas, five generations deep in a fundamentalist Pentecostal sect, was ordained in that uh, major. A United Methodist neighbor lady of mine, unwittingly, not knowing just how sectarian and exclusivistic my group was, befriended me and handed me a a book. I guess I was 18, 19 years old, a book written by an evangelical author outside of my group. Now, within my group, I wasn't supposed to read what was referred to as external literature. We were so exclusivistic when we started other world religions, we weren't studying Hindus and Buddhists, we were studying Baptists and Methodists, that's how exclusivistic we were. But I remember I read the book and I was scandalized because I couldn't imagine that someone from the wrong group 
could speak so eloquently and movingly about God. And that began a journey for me. Literally, I've always said I, I bibliographied my way upstream. I didn't have anyone that I could talk to about religious authors, especially in the evangelical world that I was in. If you really want to know what they're thinking, don't read what they write, read who they read. Mm. Because they were writing for a group of people that demanded sameness and unanimity on ideas. But I found that most of these people were reading beyond themselves. And so through their bibliographies, I just continued to swim upstream. And the little uh, backwoods pond that I grew up in that I thought was the ocean, and my mind continued to expand, scandalize, and then expand. I finally found my way to a, a much wider ocean of thought. That was a long journey for me, a painful journey. Those raised it like myself and fear-based religions know that that journey is harrowing because reshaping a conscience that has been defined by eternity and fear and heaven and hell and all of those things, who's in, who's out, who's pleasing God, it's a daunting journey, but it's a journey that I've enjoyed. And these days I try to share that with other people, just trying to help people break free, not just from the damage, but from the continuing ideas. So were you reading some of these early works in secret or did you have other people in your direct circle that you could talk about some of these ideas with? I was reading them uh, in total private. Uh, we weren't supposed to be reading that literature. Elder ministers were allowed to read it because they had the wherewithal spiritually it was said to handle that kind of thing. but. Young ministers, we would be tainted. Um, so I literally, when my Methodist neighbor la lady gave me the book, I put it under my bed. It was the closest thing I had to a Playboy in those days. It was this <laughs> book by Max Licato. But I, I, was, I was totally alone in the process, which in and of itself was a difficulty, but there was no mm -hmm. one to talk to. Yeah, that's incredible. So I know something that you talk about a lot, uh, Stan, is... A uh, fear-based religion, and for you know, as, as in, in the context of this show, um, the difference between fear-based religion and a freer version of spirituality. How did you find your way out of the fear, and how did that really impact where your life journey went? Slowly, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of this has to do with personality. One of my favorite authors, Frederick Beekner, said, "If theology has three parts, two of them are autobiography." So personality weighs into these things. My brother grew up on the same pew that I did two years apart, and he was Teflon for all of the ideas, and I was Velcro. So mm -hmm. for whatever reason, my psyche just absorbed these things. Mm -hmm. By the time I was in second grade, I was suffering from a spastic colon because I was fearful that I was going to miss the rapture. Mm -hmm. I would come home, and if I couldn't find my, um, you know, I had been left behind. So for whatever reason, my personality, I was that child that was like a black wool mm -hmm. sweater for Lent. I just absorbed it. So it was a very slow journey. And I think that's what makes me empathic for the folk that I work with, because it's a journey that I know very well, a journey that has a lot of white knuckling and hand wringing and mm -hmm. a lot of internal consternation. So it was a mm -hmm. slow, slow journey for me. I, I relate to that in so many ways. Um, you know, the nightmares of childhood of, as you said, being left behind or um, the end of the world right. and not having anyone to talk to and, and having that deep sense of commitment, whether you wanted it or not. For me, it was firstborn type A, whatever else you want to call it. I just said, I can do this as good as the grownups. You know, I grew up very fast in, in a weird way because, you know, I'm sure like you teaching or preaching or whatever, but as a very young teenager. So, um, it was hard to see how other kids and even other siblings didn't um, didn't feel this compelling. So I think the long journey out, though, what you said was so beautiful because oh, everything is a gift in its own time. And like be developing that empathy for the people you work with is such a gift that cannot be replaced with anything else. Right. Of course, I do a lot of work. The bulk of my work now is advocacy for my LGBTQ brothers and sisters. Obviously, the sort of circles that I hail from, this is a group that's been very mm -hmm. terribly mistreated. And I really work at the intersection of two wounds because as much as the LGBTQ community has been wounded deeply by fear-based theology, 
conservative Christian theology, I, they, are, they are being wounded by a group of people who in and of themselves are wounded. Mm -hmm. They're wounded by ideas about God that are, are horrific in, in my mind as, as sincere convictions. Mm -hmm. These aren't people who wake up every day hating other people. These are people who have horrible ideas about God. I can say for myself as an LGBTQ ally and someone who does this work, I didn't change my heart toward queer people. I changed my mind about God and scripture. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. reason I changed my mind about God and scripture was because of their suffering. Mm -hmm. And it was my love for them and their suffering that just dogma that I had received, that it drove me back to my text, back to my tradition saying, have I read this most faithfully? Is mm -hmm. this another case is this another case where the Christian church has got something terribly wrong and needs to be corrected, which we have a long history of. Mm -hmm. So built into our hermeneutics should be a measure of humility that we've been wrong before. We started wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the beginning days of the Christian church, we believed Gentiles were excluded from access to the gospel. Built into the fabric of our story is this capacity to be wrong and this capacity to be corrected. But that process uh, really is 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 a deep process that is protracted for a lot of people. And so I have a lot of sympathy for those who hold those ideas because I don't think they wake up in the morning trying to be wrong or trying to be harsh. I think they're doing the best they can with the information mm -hmm. they have. And it is a process to undo those things and to rewire. There's a sense of earnestness that I respect um, I sometimes say, you know, if I had been raised in a totally different religion where violence was part of the religion and taught, or if I was taught that I should blow myself up, I would have done it. Because when you're so completely committed, when you're so completely in it, you you fully believe and you don't really know any different. Um, and so when I come across people in any religion that are still in a sense um, stuck in their own fear or in their, I, I still respect their earnestness they may cause damage and I don't justify their actions, but I do understand their earnestness. How does that make you feel when you kind of have a foot on both sides of the fence from your personal experience dealing with say extra conservative leadership in religious organizations, as opposed to dealing with a family who has a gay child and is struggling to find their way within their organization? I've done 24 funerals in the last 37 months for queer people. Mm. Of the 24, 17 of them were young people under the age of 21. Mm. All of the all of their deaths were highly correlative to bad theology. Mm. This type of psychological damage, this type of uh, this type of ideology should find should find no cover uh, behind religious freedom. There is a point where civil society has to push back against pillars of society like religion, education, the arts, and hold them accountable. Now, religion doesn't like to be held accountable by anybody because it always thinks it has the ultimate moral high ground. But the reality is, if religious freedom is being used to harm and damage that religious freedom needs to be challenged because mm -hmm. you, you you cannot fly planes in the World Trade Centers even if you're calling on the name of God. Mm -hmm. Sincerity and ardor and conviction does not justify abuse. And we know right now that LGBTQ children raised in these kinds of conservative traditions being told that this fundamental part of their life, one of the most beautiful parts of their life, is somehow an abomination to God, something that dis that literally is flying a psychological plane through their soul and it mm -hmm. is damaging. And these children, these children are ideating and actually attempting uh, suicide at rates seven, eight times, greatly mm -hmm. exaggerated rates over other, over and against other queer children who are raised in affirming homes. So this, this is a life and death issue. And I know I can't prove right out of the shoe is that these kids are dying and experiencing depression and drug abuse because of bad theology. But I'm at least appealing to their conscience and saying, mm -hmm. well, I'm not 
I, I'm not claiming this is directly cause and effect. I know there are a lot of elements involved. You cannot claim that it's strictly coincidental. There is a correlation here, and there is a moral demand of your religion. There is a Christian ethic mm -hmm. that says incarnationally, if there is human suffering connected to our ideas, we have to go back to the... It's another example like chattel slavery, where we have mm -hmm. gotten something terribly wrong in the name of God. Absolutely. And... and and uh, we have a few comments from the from listeners here will pop up. Um, one of them from Dr. Lyman Montgomery said, everything is a gift. It's so powerful. And he also said, as an ordained minister, we need to reach humanity with the good news of the gospel, which is centered on love, not hate or judgment. And we also have a comment from Melissa. I've lived my whole life preparing for the end of the world and being afraid to live life. I have been redefining many religious beliefs that were based on culture and tradition and not doctrine. Um, thank you, Lyman. Thank you, Melissa. And I think, you know, what you were just saying, Stan, too, there's a spiritual responsibility for the spiritual community. As a spiritual community, we have a responsibility to these kids and to everyone um, who is struggling with that fear-based teaching. And, and of course, my conservative friends push back and say, well, the reason these kids are ideating about suicide making these attempts on their life is because that's the result of sin in their life. And, and I, I understand that's an easy response on their part. The problem is these children, I know these children, I work with these children. I was just with a hundred parents a few nights ago, LDS parents, Mormon parents, people from a conservative, parents who are now deconstructed and disoriented and I stood with them and I talked to them for hours the other night. And these parents were telling me when my child came out to me, it didn't make sense to me because everything I knew about this was this was a sin. This was an abomination. But this child, this one of our five children was the kindest and the sweetest, the kid on the front row of the church, the one that was most sincere. And, and there's just that comes in the heart of those parents. And I'll tell you about those parents over and against professional clergy. Professional clergy are playing with plastic chips and monopoly money. Those parents are playing with every dime they have in the world, the vulnerable heart of their child laid on the table. And they are the prophetic conscience of the church, not the ivory tower. And in our tradition, when God came into the world through the person of Jesus Christ, there was a woman, his mother, who knew who he was even when the officials hmm. him. And in the beginning of this work, I was surrounded by thousands of evangelical and Catholic mothers who were changing on this issue. And I thought they were somehow a consolation prize of co-labor while I was waiting on the bishops and priests and apostles to catch up. I now realize they weren't the consolation prize. They are the ultimate prophetic mm. conscience on this. They have the ultimate credibility because they are playing with the ultimate skin in the game. And that's the life of their children. Kids right because the church has gotten this terribly wrong. Stan, I love how you contrast where you were when you started this spiritual journey and where you are now. One thing you mentioned early was about rewiring your thinking. How did you go about rewiring your thinking as, and sharing your story might be a way to help others figure out how that could work for them? How did you, you know, do this, it? This process has been described popular language today, especially in kind of post-evangelical circles, is the language of deconstruction and deconstruction and then new construction. Um, Walter Brueggemann, one of my favorite Hebrew scripture uh, scholars, describes the Psalms as Psalms set in three different in three different ways or three different settings, three different venues. He said there are Psalms of naive orientation, Psalms of disorientation, orientation. Um, Paul Ricoeur, the great French existentialist philosopher, described those three stages as first naivete, sophistication, second naivete, pre-critical thought, critical thought, post-critical thought. Mm. What happens for most of us is we begin the journey, we begin the journey of spiritual construction in a religious setting where by the age of five, six, seven, eight years old, we already know is about God that are concretized and we are told these things are are so orthodox that our eternal consequence depends upon them 
Mm-hmm. And so even some, even before we're literate, pre-literate children already have ideas about what determines the difference between being tortured forever in hell and living forever in bliss in heaven. So those ideas that are concretized in our brain, as that wet to harden the trowel that could have smoothed those things over and reshaped the lines, ultimately the trowel has to be uh, has to be exchanged for a, a, a sledgehammer. And the thing that moves us out of those stages of pre-critical thought, naive orientation, original religious construction, generally are life events. For a mm-hmm. lot of people, it's having a queer child. For a mm-hmm. lot of people, it's realizing that they are people. It's some existential crisis that is just so dissonant with their received dogma that they're driven in their disorientation to, to open their heart. I, I heard someone just the other day, one of these parents who had lost a child, good friends of mine who had lost a child, they said, a, a broken heart is highly correlative to an open mind. Mm. And often, and it's a tragedy, but often it's the breaking of heart. Mm-hmm. It's a vulnerable enough place that we're willing to revisit these concretized things, these standards, mm-hmm. these orthodoxies. And that period of, of thought is called critical thought. It's, it's, it's disorienting and everything we thought we knew, we don't know. Um, but fortunately there's a stage even beyond critical thought and that's post-critical thought where we can recapture the awe and the wonder. Jesus even mm. talked about being, becoming a, talk about beginner's mind. There is the capacity to be called from the desert of criticism back to the awe and the wonder and those things mm. are recaptured and there's a balance between the better lenses of academics and science but all is not lost um i remember when my daughter lost a literal santa claus she became bitter and angry and thought the whole world had created this ruse of santa to make money and i remember one day as she was just in that bitterness uh, an evangelist to tell all of the other kids that there's no santa claus i stopped her and i said i need to tell you i still believe in santa claus and i explained to her a post-critical santa claus one that is not less than the literal Santa Claus, but is even more. Mm. So, so there's this process of, of, of naive construction, disorienting deconstruction, and even the sophistication that, that replaces one fundamentalism with another, and yet it's bereft of any hope and any gentleness and any wonder. And then there's that call again. I don't know who it was that said the the young person who doesn't weep is a barbarian, but the old person who doesn't laugh is a fool. Oof, wow. It's a, it's, it's a process that we can eventually be called again, not to become childish, but mm-hmm. to become childlike. No, I love that. Rediscovering, just like in the natural world, when child, children are so excited about what is new and what is beautiful. And, and what you said about whether it's parents or anyone else, when at some point, you, as humans, we're going to move away from pain and towards comfort. And if your religion is giving you so much more pain than comfort, you have to move at some point in order to sustain yourself, which, you know, is just (laughs) common sense. I just want to take one second for anyone who might have just joined the show late. Um, We're talking today with Dr. Uh, Pastor Stan Mitchell. And if you have any questions or comments for him, uh, we're responding here live on the show. So, Please continue to enter those and we'll respond to as many of them as we can, um, which um, so this is just a such an incredible conversation. And you said to me something the other day, Stan, when we were chatting um, about helping people who are afraid of hell and afraid of heaven. <laughs> Do you want to explain a little bit what you mean by that to those who may relate? Well, I, th- I, I think fear-based religion is really based on the strength of the insurance algorithm. Uh, Humans, for as long as we have been human, have been wrestling with angst um, about the afterlife. We, We don't know what's going to happen to us after we die, and we don't know where we're going and what's going to happen after biological death. And so religion really began in earnest 
when people came into that conversation and said, hey, I, I can help you with that angst for a small phenomenal fee, generally, I can help you, you know, settle your mind and provide you with some measure of certainty. And, you know, it, it's just, it, the insurance algorithm that is involved here is to avoid the possible catastrophic reasonable we figure out a reasonable premium that we can pay religiously to offset the uncertainty of what's going to happen to us in the afterlife and i i think as long as we carry that angst we are vulnerable to that desire for certainty to settle our minds about heaven and hell even the people i work with smart people wise people people in their 50s and 60s still question what what if what if we're wrong because if there's a one percent chance that we're going to burn forever with our families and be eaten by worms wouldn't it make sense to at least take out some kind of a policy, some religious policy. And here in the West, it really doesn't take much to take out that policy. Shoot, in the Southeast where I grew up, they'll pay the policy for you. It pays to be a conservative Christian there. So I, I think the whole fear is incredibly sensitive. It's provocative. It's, it's easy to fall prey to. And I don't know anyone. And honestly, I don't know that science is ever going to assuage completely our sensitivities around what happens after we die. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we're ever going to get a conclusion on that. So religion, especially fear-based religion, really offers a way to hedge our bets over and against that fear. Mm -hmm. There's there's a there's a challenge around, uh, and then sorry, uh, Roger, I'll uh, divert to you in a moment. Um, there's a challenge around our human um, need for certainty, and and maybe that's part of the conversation that could actually be had. You know, um, how can you be certain if this is actually what we called the show today? Because it's something you had mentioned, uh, Stan it says, I'm spiritual, but what if I lack certainty? And maybe lacking certainty is a new normal that we can learn to be happy in, or maybe not. What do you think? And say, and I can't remember the author of this idea, but it's a brilliant idea that, uh, you know, our brains are wired such that often we would rather have a false certainty than an honest uncertainty. Mm. And, you know, the problem with the religious promise to satisfy any of our angst about the afterlife, the problem with that is we have hundreds and hundreds of groups offering different solutions and different interpretations. The God of eternity evidently has left it up to us to decide amongst the experts which one of those hundreds has it exactly right. And the reality is that's such an untenable idea it, it's not even something that I fear anymore as much as something that I, I, I'm, I'm sad about because it just, it makes no sense to me. If that's who the creator of the universe is, we are all in such terrible trouble anyway. It, it just makes no sense. I think the world and I think the universe, I think whoever the creator is, has got to be far more generous than that. But I grew up with a group of people that belief somewhere in the early part of the 20th century, the God of eternity spoke to them expressly. And that little bitty group of people had the corner on God, mm -hmm. had the buy into truth. And when I was with the 100 LDS parents the other night and I told my story, it sounded to them like I grew up in one more iteration of the same story. This is dating myself, but it reminds me a little bit of Dragnet. The names and the places are changed, but the story is exactly the same. We've got the corner on God. We can tell you how to take care of your angst, and the fee's not too great, but we can take care of it for you in our holy place. And uh, I just, I, I think the skinny is up on that kind of ideology. As prone as we are to, not to mature beyond it, I personally, as a Christian minister, believe I'm trying to help my religion mature. And if it mm. doesn't, then I feel like I'm doing hospice palliative care for something that I love dearly, that has seen its better day. And if it's not going to mature, it needs to go quietly into the night because I believe those ideas are damaging. And I think they're going the way of wisdom, teeth and appendixes. We are evolving out of them. They are. Roger. 
So thank you. So Stan, you talked earlier about fear-based religion, and you've mentioned even some personal fears that you had to overcome. And I see you now, and you sit there with such confidence and such intelligence and such courage. Can you share with our listeners and our viewers a little bit about how do they work through the fear or how do they tr work to get past the fear if they are in a place of fear right now, whether they're afraid that religions, their religion is going to be wrong or they're going to burn in hell or they're, you know, they're not quite on the right track. How do they get to the point where they can come to terms with something so they move from fear to something toward courage? Well, again, I, I think we have to open both our mind and our heart. One of the one of the most, I mean, several elements for me were very helpful in the process. Number one, find a better idea. As I had to expose my mind, and so I, I gave myself to the reading of literature. Um, but the other thing that I did that was incredibly helpful is I found people like me, so I did not feel alone. I remember C.S. Lewis um, made the statement that we read to know that we're not alone. Hmm. And I, I found people who were reading the same books, people who were having the same thoughts. We smelled one another out. <laughs> and there was great comfort knowing that I wasn't crazy. In those moments that I could question myself, I could look around at these wonderful people and they didn't look like reprobates. They didn't have sulfurous breath and yellow eyes and a long tail. They were good <laughs> people doing their best. So I think it's, it's much safer and much healthier to do this kind of thing in community. Mm -hmm. Those mama, mm -hmm. those uh, those mamas that I was talking about a moment ago, my friend Liz Dyer started a group for them called Seren Southern Baptist mom of a queer kid who did not handle his coming out well. Mm -hmm. And in her deconstruction, she found a dozen other moms. Mm -hmm. 10 years later, that group has 37,000 evangelical mothers in it and they rely on one another, they lean on one another, they fall apart together. Remember the old country singer Merle Haggard said, looking for a place to fall apart. You gotta find a safe place to fall apart. And those found it because when they think that they're going crazy, they find others who are having those same thoughts. And it's just incredibly helpful. That's amazing and, and so true and so beautiful. and and so much of the intention behind even this show, which is creating a space, a community, where people can feel safe having these conversations, asking these questions. We're not trying to teach or put, you know, put out one theory or one answer. We're just saying, let's come together. What if, what would the world look like if we could connect to each other, heart and soul, just as spiritual humans, spiritual human beings in love, finding the things that we relate to one another, finding our commonalities instead of emphasizing our differences and then have that conversation. This could be a transformative conversation. And honestly, there's so many people waiting to have it. And in my experience, even a lot of extremely traditional and conservative people who are welcome here are some of the ones who really want to have this conversation and fear has just kind of held them back. So creating this place for them to be is a big part of what we're doing. And one more comment here again, thank you, uh, Dr. Lyman Montgomery. He said, isolation is hell, community is heaven. Wonderful, that's so true. So true. I actually, the, the church that I founded in, in Nashville, we literally created that place for disoriented people coming from conservative Christian backgrounds. And it was the most lovely thing. And uh, we, it, the church is 20 years old now, and it's still a place where people can come. And from our tradition, fall at the feet of Jesus and believe that there's room to deconstruct and to question as much as there's room to worship and learn. And uh, I think places like this, you guys show, it's, it's truly part of it. Absolutely. Uh, Roger? So I, I find it very interesting that what you shared in your presentation and what Anne was talking about the purpose of the show coincided with something that I learned a long time ago. I found it interesting that when I was growing up and I realized that my theology wasn't a good fit for the religion I was brought up with, I felt the need to leave it, to find something different. 
I was watching a show one time where there were women who stayed in the religion that I was raised in to make the changes from within. And just as the examples you shared about some of the mothers in those churches, you don't necessarily, I'm understanding that we don't necessarily need to leave the religion of our, our, of our ancestry or of our youth to find this sense of courage and identity. Do you find that same thing true, that you don't necessarily have to leave the religion you're in, that you might find it where you started? I can say for myself and for many, that's absolutely true. For those who do move beyond and find a different narrative, a different alphabet, a different lexicon, I totally appreciate that. But for me, Christianity, my mother tongue has become my lingua franca, but it's only my lingua franca, my primary language, because I, it allows me in this iteration to be multilingual. But I personally think um, Christianity if it matures, if it continues to grow, as I believe it can, I think it, 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 it's a lovely religion. I think as a salvific religion that's exclusivistic, um, it's, it's, it's really atrocious. But as a wisdom tradition that invites people into the right questions and conversations as, as opposed to a constitutional final answer, I think it's a wonderful wisdom tradition. You can stay, but I think you have to stay under loving protest. And I think you have to stay believing the best and pushing your religion to continue to follow that evolutionary trail of maturation. I love that. That is so beautiful. Uh, we're going to pause for just a moment to um, handle a couple items of business or commercial, if you will. And then we're going to come back for a last few comments here from Stan, who we're, we're just so grateful to have here today. So again, um, if you're listening, feel free to send in your last questions or comments. We have just a few minutes left. Uh, please follow us. Check out our website at imspiritualbutt.com or shoot us a message there. And um, a couple announcements, good and sad. Um, Dr. Roger Leslie, my wonderful co-host, um, is going to be taking a bit of a sabbatical um, after this week. He has, as you already know, written over 15 books, and he's extremely active uh, in his writing and editing. He also has a publishing company, and he's launching an amazing book in a few weeks. So he's going to be taking a little break from us, but he'll be back to tell us uh, more details around the book launch. But uh, Roger, tell us the title of your book and just a, a, little, a little sneak peek. So the name of the book is Light Come Out of the Closet, Memoir of a Gay Soul. And it is my spiritual journey of what I went through as a child when I learned or discovered early on that who I was did not fit what my religion, what my family, or what my society was teaching was a decent, good human being. I had to reconcile that some way. I took a deep journey within, looked for my soul, searched it. And the culmination of this book is the epiphany I had where I finally found my soul. And so that's the memoir that I wrote, and it will be coming out in June. We're doing lots of promotions right now. And I couldn't be more thrilled that this book might help so many people, especially those like the ones that Stan talked about, the young LGBTQ people who are struggling so much. Amazing. And I'm so excited. We're all so that excited for you and your book. Uh, Roger, thank you so much for sharing. And it's been a delightful having you here. And I know we're going to have you back. We will miss you, but also just so excited about this work you're doing. And, and um, along with Stan, this transformative conversation around people who have felt that they are the other within their faith and um, helping them find that freedom and identity, that, that, that essence of love, moving away from fear and towards love, which to me was always what the gospel was about anyway. <laughs> Um, and Melissa Morgan said uh, to you, she had a thank you for you, Roger. She says, thank you, Roger. That's exactly where I am. I want to stay and be part of change from within. But I also understand why others feel the need to leave. So I think part of that, uh, creating an environment of openness and freedom for the for those spiritual people around us is really a gift we can give, whether we're in a religious organization by choice, whether we're out, um, 
can we give each other the freedom to choose to find our own deep connection with the divine and support each other, whether or not we all conform to the same thing? And so, Stan, I want to turn it over to you for any last Last comments or thoughts for for us today. And again, we thank him for being here. He's in the airport. He's two of his flights have been canceled, and he's 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 holding tight there, and he didn't uh, didn't miss our time together. So thank you, Stan. Well, I love what Roger said. Uh, He came to himself. And I think from my tradition, the Christian tradition, if there is a gospel, we used to say the gospel was that people could be reunited with God. I think uh, that good news has been supplanted by an understanding that there's even greater news. We were never separated. The prodigal did not come to God because God's never left. The prodigal came to himself. Roger came to himself. He moved into his own heart where the divine had always been to come home to ourselves. We do not become the beloved. We finally understand that's who we've always been. And uh, I, I, I look forward to reading that book, Roger. You have lived it well, and it is good news for sure. Thank you, Stan. Thank you so much. Absolutely thank you guys. For, thank you for having me. And thank you for tolerating the background <laughs> noise of an airport. Next time I'll be in a sterile, pretty place. Absolutely. Well, we hope we can have a next time because this has been a real gift to us and to our listeners. And I know there's so much more and so many people. Uh, one last comment here from Nancy Ayer. She says, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. You're helping so many people. And a secret from Nancy is that she was instrumental in getting the the ball in motion to help us get Stan on the show today. So we want to thank Nancy. She was our second guest in January. And so we have been um, thrilled to for the journey we have had this far. Thank you, Roger. Thank you so much, Stan. All of you, thank you for listening. Please tune in. We're live every week at uh, Wednesdays at noon Eastern Standard at 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, send us your suggestions if you have guests that you would like to recommend And as always, um, we wish you spiritual joy and peace, and we'll see you next week.